and they wanted to say, oh, I wonder how much G-forces a, a human can withstand before, like, they die. And so a guy, a doctor, this guy was a doctor, decided he would volunteer, and so he strapped himself to this rocket sled. And where he, he's, where he sees the most G-forces is when they hit the water at the end and kind of slow way down. I think they said that this guy made it to 83 Gs. So 83 times the, right? Obviously, people have been exposed to more of that. They usually die, right? The car accidents and stuff like that. You feel that the, you, you, you would feel way more G-forces than 83 G, but you die. And, and in this particular case, he does live. It's a little bit different of like you never do this nowadays right like there was a different different breed back then right i also want to point out uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to that yeah it, it's it, it's 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 crazy what we used to do all right so this is a guy uh going to 80, 83 g's he was in the air force at the time and then i can't control the volume so i it's gonna be loud two other air force officers john paul Stapp and eli beating to demonstrate that men could withstand g-forces as they would be experienced during a rocket launch and re-entry. On the Holloman rocket sled, Stapp reached a top speed of 640 miles per hour and slammed to a full stop in 1.4 seconds. Is that nuts? Yeah, he suffered no serious or permanent ill effects from the 55G <laughs> peak deceleration load he took. Beating subjected himself to an incredible 83 Gs in a later test made on the shorter Daisy track. Beating went into a state of shock and for a time was considered to be in a critical condition. Five days later, however, he was back at work with no permanent disability. <laughs> Good. Good. These and other intrepid human volunteers took risks at least as dangerous as those they had required of the animal subjects. And the data thus gained contributed significantly to the successful flights of Alan Shepard, John Glenn, and their successors. Why are you not investing in tax uh, No, seriously. Why are you not investing oh do do? into one of the most incredible real estate strategies that's the most Remember I said I was good at this? So. Activity. Okay, anyways, uh, I, I really want to pay for YouTube, so I get rid of all those ads. Anybody do that? Does anybody pay for YouTube? Is it worth it? Oh, really? I wonder if I could pass. I wonder if I could pass as a student. I wonder. I think I might be, because I got a .edu email, maybe. I think I, I, think I got it. Um, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So 83 G's, that guy felt. Uh, so the other one, let's see here. So actually, this is more relevant to what we're doing today. So today we're going to get into curvilinear motion, right? And you've heard, this is again reviewed, that, that motion in one direction is isolated from motion in another direction, right? So a perfect example is projectile motion, which we're going to get in today, that again review from, from physics, but that you, the Y component is isolated from what's happening in the X component, right? They, we just treat them as two separate 1D problems, and then you combine them together and you get the full path of how something is moving, right? And is it okay to assume that they're in a vacuum? Absolutely, right? Once you get out of the vacuum, then then you get you get drag and lift and all sorts of stuff in the air that kind of kind of messes with that assumption right there. But for the most part, we're gonna assume that they're decoupled motion is what we say there. Right, and you may have heard this before. My son actually in, in, in high school right now came home the other day and was all excited about it. Was that, you know, if you drop a bullet, if you drop a bullet and shoot a bullet, they both hit the ground at the same time, right? And, and that's, you know, in a vacuum, right? That's not really necessarily what would happen because there would be lift and stuff. But the idea would be that you, that, that would happen, right? And so this guy put together a little experiment just to kind of demonstrate it, that that indeed is what happened. So this is from Harvard. Let's get forward here. Very, there you go. 
So at the same, at right, he releases this spring, it drops one ball at the exact same time that another ball gets shot off to the side, and you'll watch that both of those cue balls hit the ground at the same time. Very, dr very dramatic way of showing that. But it, that's proof, look, see? It's decoupled motion. We can treat those two things separate, right? It's accelerating in the Y direction. It's uh, it, the same on both, both objects, right? What I would like to see sometime is like in a vacuum, as a YouTube video, see if it's somebody fight from the, something big in the vacuum, because if you drop a feather and then like a brick, they both hit the ground at the same time in a vacuum. I've never actually seen that. I, like I believe it, but I've never seen somebody actually do that. They did it on the moon. They did it on the moon. I mean, allegedly, like we went to the moon, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Allegedly, if you believe in that, right? But. That, I mean, that brings up a good point. That technology, I don't know, has anybody ridden in a car from the 60s? Yes, like, it, it is terrifying. <laughs> is, it, is it terrifying a little bit, right? It's like squirrely, and, or if you built it, if you, if you, if you fixed it up some. It is shock. No power steering, no power brakes, no assistive clutch. Yeah. I'm really good with both of these watches. But, it's, it, it's, but it, it, it's a different technology, right? Yeah, that, I, I, yeah, that's right. Right, and there's no computers in it and stuff like that. Now, that technology we went to the moon with, right? I mean, that should, that is, and we haven't been back since, which is which is which is crazy, right? Like now we could do it comfortably, but then back then it was just like, hey, I think we could do this. I think we can too. Let's give it a shot. We might die. Who cares? Let's do it. And they did it, right? I mean, it is allegedly, and it is. It is pretty crazy, so. Yeah, we kind of saw all there is to say. What's that? We kind of saw all there is to say in this there. Yeah, yeah. It'd be cool. I, I think we're supposed to go back here soon, right? Hey? That'd be good. Let's go back with it, get some HD videos, and then maybe somebody will drop a feather and a, and a brick for me. In HD. Okay, so let's get into this curved motion, right? So this is, everything we've done so far is 1D motion. What we learned in 1D motion Right, we learned it. Uh, acceleration of function of time, constant acceleration, acceleration of function of velocity, acceleration of function of position. All of those things we're still going to use. It's just now we're going to look at the x and y direction, right, and z direction if we want. We could do 3D problems. It, 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 all of that stuff we learned before is still valid. It's just it's just now we're going to combine the three different directions, and they end up being three. 1D problem. So if you if you got the 1D stuff, this would be just fine. You just kind of decoupled, solve three three separate motions. We're gonna deal with these things in three different coordinate systems. The coordinate systems we're gonna do is Cartesian coordinate system, but that's usually everybody's favorite. That's the X, Y, and Z. Uh, normal tangent, which may be new to you, all right? Uh, and there's certain reasons why that one would be helpful. And then the last one, which should be familiar to you, is the polar or cylindrical coordinates. That also should be helpful. And certain types of problems uh, are going to be easier solved with uh, different methods. The normal tangent eh, kind of is part of polar or cylindrical, but we'll get to that. Okay, so we're going to start out with everybody's favorite, uh, Cartesian coordinates, right? And we're going to derive velocity and accelerations in three different directions for this, right? So we're going to start out with uh, talking about position. So if we've got a coordinate system, like this, x, y, and z coordinate system, it has an origin, and then we have a position vector that points to a particle that's traveling along a path. So we've got a path that starts out up here and then it's traveling along that path, okay? And that's how we're gonna find position with a, a, a vector r, which we've seen that before. All right, so r in this case is gonna have three components, all right? r is gonna be x in the i direction plus y in the j direction plus z in the k direction, right? And that's how we're going to talk about vectors in here, is with that, right? Yeah, I'm sure you've seen that before with, with vectors, calling something an i and a j and a k. Those are unit vectors, right, that point, you know, in the x, y, and z, z directions in this, right? That's how we're going to define it. Can you, and if you wanted to, could you call your vectors like this? You may have seen vectors called out as row vectors, x, Y, Z. And then the I, J, and the K are implied in this. Right? Or you can call them out like this. You can call it a column vector, X, Y, and Z. And usually you put a 
square bracket around these guys. All of those ways, that if you want to, if you want to, like while you're solving problems, to do them that way, that's fine. Right? This this one, these two imply this is the i, j, and the k directions. Right? There's some reasons why we're going to do it this way, which we'll get into in a second here. Just when we start taking derivatives and stuff like that, it, it makes more sense to leave it in that form. Okay. So usually in most of my problems, I, I do it this way. Right? If you're going to use it, you your calculators will actually do vectors right and if you're doing calculators or on a computer right you're gonna you're gonna use vectors like this you don't use ij's in case you put them in like like you see right here with like square braces around them. okay so that's our first version of of a vector right the other thing i do is i put a i'm gonna put a line over each of i, I think i'm usually pretty consistent if it is a vector versus a scalar i will put a line over the vectors just to indicate that that is indeed a vector okay. we kind of dropped the line when we we're talking scalar because that was that there was no vectors Okay, so in these things, this I, J, and K, we put hats on them. That's what you call them, hats. I hat, J hat, K hat. Those things just indicate that these things are unit vectors or base vectors. All right, or unit vectors. Unit vectors mean that they have a direction, but they have no magnitude. They have a magnitude of one. Right. Direction, but magnitude of one. Okay. And that's what the hat is. The, the line on top just says it's a vector. Right, and then the hats just say that it's a vector that's pointed in each of those directions. Okay. The unit vectors. Okay, so now we're going to take come down here, and we're going to talk about velocity. Right. So in this coordinate system, when we have the three different directions, uh, we're going to look at, at at velocity. Velocity is the time rate of change of position. Right. How does position change with respect to time? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative of that vector. Right. Of our r vector. So we come down to velocity and we say the velocity is going to be a vector of t is going to be the derivative dr dt, right? And r is a vector, right? So we also, we're going to substitute in that r. So this is going to be equal to uh, dx in the i plus y in the j plus z in the k, all of that dt. Okay. Now, here's a little flashback right, to your calculus. If you take the derivative of things that are added together, or things multiplied together, what do we have to do? The things that are multiplied by, the, by, by each other. What's that? Product yeah, the product rule. What is the product rule? <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. That's good. You got it. You take the derivative of the first thing, and then you leave the second thing alone, right? And then you go on to the, and then you take the derivative of the second thing and leave the first thing alone, right? That's the product rule. And so you, we have to do that here because you have x times i, y times j, and z times k. The other ones we can just add together, right? The add we just add together. Okay. So let's do that. So this would be, this would become dx dt. So I've taken the derivative of the first thing, which is x. And I leave the second thing alone, which is i. And then I add on to it, I leave the first thing alone, which is x, and I take the derivative of the second thing, which is i. Right? So that's all just that first term. Right? And then we just keep, keep going with the rest of it. Take the derivative of the first thing, dy, dt, and the j, plus leave the first thing alone, which is y, dj, dt. Keep going dz, dt, and the k, plus z times dk, dt. Right. I kind of blew up on us a little bit, but that's what it, is. it ends up being like. So mathematically, if you take the derivative of that thing, because even though it's a unit vector, i is a unit vector, it is still being multiplied by something. It is still something you can take the derivative of. Okay, so now we get to this point right here. Right. 
This is this is some this is going to survive, right? This guy right here, di dt. How does our unit vector i change with respect to time? Right. So here's this guy over here. You got i's here, right? I, j, and k. And how is it? How's that? How are those going to change with respect to time? It's not right because it's it's just kind of off and it's sitting over to the side. And so if I take the derivative of i, i doesn't change with respect to time, right? This stuff changes, right? The, the, the particle's moving along that path. Ooh, this particle's moving along that path. That changes, but our coordinate system's just kind of sitting off to the side. It's not changing. So everything, every time you take the derivative of our unit vectors, that goes to zero. That guy's zero. This guy's zero. And this guy's zero. Right. The reason we can, you know, that kind of maybe is like self-evident, like, oh, we're, that, that's going to happen. Later on, when we have these other coordinate systems, our other coordinate systems are actually on the body and they're moving along with it. Our polar coordinate system is actually on the body and it's moving with the body, right? And so in that case, when we take the derivative of the coordinate system, it's going to be something. Something's going to happen when we take the derivative. In Cartesian coordinates, it's not on the body. It's sitting off to the side. It doesn't affect anything. Okay. So with that, that leads us to this. Yeah, there's our big finding. The velocity this is what we just kind of showed. It, 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 they're independent. What's happening in the x, what's happening in the y, and what's happening in the j direction are independent. Right? So if we want to take that, there's the velocities right there. All those other components go to, go to nothing. And we just end up, so this ends up being its own problem. This is its own problem, and that's its own problem. Right? You could do the same thing with accelerations. Once you get to that stage right there, you could do the same thing. You could take the derivative, right? You take the derivative of the velocity. We'll do a dot, dot, dot. We don't need to do the same, the whole thing again. But you say acceleration is equal to the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. And the velocity now, the of vx and the i plus vy in the j plus vz in the k, all of that dt, right? And then if you carried that out, you would do, let's do a couple of terms here. You would have dvx dt in the i plus vx times di dt. And then we'll put it in a plus dot, dot, dot. We don't need to keep going to, with it. But then, again, that di dt goes to zero. And you're just left with the components that we're not taking the derivatives. And so what that leads us to is this guy. Okay. Those are definitions for accelerations. Right. Like I said, the, the reason we spend so much time doing it this way is later on when we do normal tangent and polar coordinates when we take the derivative of our coordinate system it doesn't go away it actually turns into something right? that's where we where centripetal acceleration and stuff like that come from is by taking the derivative of our coordinate system okay any questions about that all right so all right let's do projectile motions let's do some examples associated with this Right. Right. Made the statement before. Decoupled motion is three 1D problems, basically. What's happening in the X is isolated from what happened in the Y, which isolated what's happening in the Z, just kind of completely independent motion. Right. The classic, the most classic example of this curved motion is projectile motion, shooting something, throwing something, some something of that nature. Okay. So when we do this, kind of Projectile motion makes some assumptions. Come on. Come on. Assumptions. Some assumptions we make are constant gravity, which we talked about it isn't necessarily true, right? Uh, we neglect drift, or sorry, drag and lift, drag and lift, right? And the other th assumption we make when we, in most 
of these problems is we assume that the earth is flat. Okay, just want to point out it isn't. This is just to, just to get that going, right? Just to, just to keep that theme going. It is not flat. It is not. It is not. Okay? Cause of gravity, no electric drag, lift. <laughs> We assume the Earth is flat. So those are kind of like built in to what we're going to be doing here. Okay. The other thing that in, in a pro conventional projectile motion problem, right, we assume, right, there's gravity is acting down. Right? We get a G acting down, right? And then, so then we end up with AX. AX, we assume, is zero, right? Because it's not like a rocket or something. Like, it, it, once it leaves your hand, it doesn't, it doesn't keep accelerating. And then we neglect drag. If you had drag, that wouldn't be true, right? There would be, there would be a drag force, and there would be a deceleration in the X direction. But if we neglect drag, then, then we assume that acceleration in that direction is equal to zero. And then AY is equal to negative G because it's acting in the negative y direction. So the, this ends up being a constant acceleration problem, right? We have a constant acceleration of zero in the x direction and a constant acceleration of g in the y direction. I've noticed that when I lecture, I absolutely lecture to this side of the class. I like this side of the class better. So <laughs> I apologize. Everybody on this side of the class has had a pet before. Everybody, <laughs> they're more loving and caring, and they, I just feel something's off on this side of the of the <laughs> this side of the, the deal. Yeah. Did you tell your parents what I said? No, I didn't. You should <laughs> let them know what terrible parents they did. What's that? I don't think you'll like it. You don't think so? She won't like start liking dogs after this. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, so we're on to that. Yep, negative G, we got this, hey, X, this, this. So if, I, if, if you notice me ignoring you on this side, just call me out. Say, hey, what about us over here? Yeah, come over here. Look at us. Look at us. We need attention too. Okay, so it's a constant acceleration problem, right? We had equations for constant acceleration. I'm just going to jump right to those. We're gonna start with those each time instead of driving them each time. So the velocity of x is equal to v naught x plus ax times t. So if you if you looked back in our notes for right, because it just becomes one d problems. So you just look at uh, uh, constant acceleration. It says the velocity is the initial velocity plus acceleration times time. Right, that was deri we derived that previously. So you can jump right to that. Right. In this case, we just said AX was equal to zero. So AX is equal to zero. So that guy goes to zero, right? And all we're left with is V naught X. So whatever your initial velocity is when it leaves your hand or the cannon or whatever it is, is what it's going to be at the end, right? And so that ends up being, if we're using this guy over here, right? V naught, and then we're given an initial angle. So these are the givens, is our initial velocity and our initial angle, right? So V naught cosine theta is what this is going to be. Ooh. V naught cosine theta. Right, and you're gonna, we're going to do a lot of that in here, so make sure you got your trig down. Right? The cosine component, we want the x component of that, so it's just going to be V naught co cosine theta. Okay, so then that is where this comes from. Just simple, simply that. That just tells us what our velocity is. So that's basically the velocity at the beginning is going to be the velocity at the end. There's just no acceleration component, right? Same thing you could do with the uh, X component. You can go back to, in our notes, look for constant acceleration. X of T is going to be X naught plus V naught X times T plus one half AX T squared. Right? And then here, acceleration zero. I start starting out at zero, 
Right? And there's, I think you have some homework problems where that's not necessarily the case where it starts at zero. In this case, it's starting at zero, right? Our initial position in the x direction right there is zero. And so all we're left with is the v naught times t. And our v naught x is this v naught cosine theta. And so that's what we end up with. So there's what our position is going to be. Cause the acceleration in this case is zero. Right. Look at the y direction. That's where a little bit more exciting stuff is happening because we do have acceleration. We have a negative g floating around. Right. In this case, just restate this. A y is equal to negative g, negative gravity. Again, we can just rewrite this. Oh, 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 oh. V y of t is equal to v naught y plus a y times t. Right. v naught y is the other one, right, which is going to be v naught times sine of theta. And a y is negative g, so then you end up with there. That's what our equation for velocity is in that direction. Do the same thing with the y. Again, you look this up in, our, in the back, and you can see what our position function is going to be. y naught plus v naught y times t plus 1 half a y t squared. This guy's 0. And you sub in everything else, negative g for your acceleration. Oh, what is that? And you get this. That is what your position is in the y direction. All right? Notice there's no x's in the y equation and there's no y's in the x equation. Just decouple. So you solve both of these things independently and... You get your answer. Right, we've got 20 minutes. We, gotta, we can do this next example. It's kind of just illustrating the use of these things and where, that, where those equations came from. Right, now that's in our, our toolbox, those equations. OK, let's do this example, like a real example. Right, it's a very strange problem. Let's go over this side here. Strange problem here. We've got a particle. Say a car, a car at A, and A is accelerating to the right, at ten, uh, it's traveling to the right, so it has an initial velocity of 10 feet per second, and it's accelerating at 2 feet per second squared, so it's like stepping on the gas. So point A and the red, that red right there, right on the x axis, is just going zoop, zoop, accelerating there. And then there's a very strange gun at B, okay, at B, and we're gonna launch, we're gonna shoot A from B, but it, you cannot change the angle that it's at. It's at, it's stuck at three, four, five, but all we can do is change the initial velocity to hit it. It's a very strange gun. I don't recommend it. It's the first prototype. It's a prototype, and they're trying to figure out what to do. So what we need to do is find the velocity that the, 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 the bullet at B needs to leave to hit the car, a missile. Let's say it's a missile. Let's, let's, let's lower speed. Yeah, but a missile will accelerate. It's a part. It's a projectile. I don't know. Anyways, you can get together. Okay, so this is a projectile motion problem, right? Again, a slightly different than what we just derived because this has some initial position stuff built into it. Okay, so what, how do you think? How do we? How do we know if they're going to hit each other? Like in the end, what's going to happen? Their positions are going to be the same, right? That's what's going to happen. Their positions will be the same, right? Things I don't know, variables that are going to be, I always do this before a problem, is that just lay it out like this. Like, what, how, is this how is it going to happen, right? What's going to happen if their positions are the same? Things I don't know to that I can control. I can control the initial velocity. Strangely, I can control the initial velocity of my gun. The other thing I can change, or the other thing that's unknown is time. I don't know how much time it's going to take for this to happen, okay? 
And so our solution procedure here is I'm just going to come up with the position of B in the X and Y direction as a function of time. And I'm going to figure out what the position of A is in the X and Y direction as a function of time. And I'm going to set them equal to each other. right? And then that's where you will have two equations, two unknowns. The two equations will be the X and Y direction of, of B and A. Those are, so that'll be a total of two equations. Okay? And then the two unknowns is V naught and T. All right, so let's, let's do that. Now that we kind of have a, a procedure in mind. Okay. So I am going to start out with particle A, alphabetical. Particle A. Right, and then we're going to go X direction first. Okay. Particle A in the X direction. It was given to us the acceleration. AAX was equal to 2 feet per second squared. That was given to us in the problem statement. Right? So this is a constant acceleration problem. Right? Acceleration at 2 feet per second squared. Right? And we also know that VAX is equal to 10 feet per second squared, or 10 feet per second, rather. Right, so those are the two things that are given to us, right? This is a constant acceleration. We're, again, we're after the positions of these things, right? We're going to set the positions equal to each other. So I can look up the position of a uh, projectile, the position of a projectile with constant acceleration. I'm going to call this SAX, the position of A in the X direction, is equal to S A X naught plus V A X and times T plus acceleration A A X T squared over two. You can see that it's a little. There's a lot, it's just bookkeeping at this point, right? I got the A in the X direction. And I've got the initial position of A in the X direction. That's the X naught, right? And so just trying to be clear with my variables, right? That's what the A in the X direction. Okay, so we can substitute in many of these things. This thing starts out, the initial position is zero, right? right? It's starting out at this point right here. So the initial position is zero. This initial V is over here, it's 10 feet per second. Actually, let me draw a little bit. That guy's going right here. Right? And that acceleration goes right here. All right, so let's just sub those in. So my SAX ends up being equal to 10 times T plus 2T squared over 2. And I'm going to highlight this. And that's it. That's all I could do right now. Now, I have the position of A in the X direction. Okay? How uh, about in the Y direction? What is the position of A in the Y direction? Zero. At all times. Right? It's, it's just traveling along that line. S A Y is equal to zero. Everybody see that? It's just it's on this it's on this x axis. It's not changing, so it's always gonna be equal to zero. Okay? So let's go to particle B. Uh, B. Oh, and I'm going to do X direction first. Right. In the X direction, we have no acceleration, right? 
because it is a projectile. That, that B is a projectile, so R. A, B, X is equal to zero. Write down our equation for the position of B. S, B, X is equal to S, B, X naught plus V, B, X naught times T plus A, B, X, T squared over The initial position of B in the X direction is zero. It's starting out at the same location right here, right? So that's initial position there is going to be zero. It won't be in the Y direction, right? A little foreshadowing. That guy's zero. No acceleration in the X direction. That guy's zero. So all we're left is V, B, X, naught. And so this S, B, X as a function of time is going to be equal to Four fifths V naught T. Let's, we'll take a minute to look at this. Okay. Whenever you see you know, on an exam or something like that, you see a three, four, five triangle, you should be very excited. Okay? You should be like, ah, oh, yes, three, four, five, my favorite, right? Because the, when you, and, and they, 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 we put them in there specifically so that you can kind of skip the taking sines and cosines. So you could just you could jump right to this, right? So the cosine of something is opposite over hypotenuse, right? So in this case, I'm looking at this angle right here. The opposite is four, the hypotenuse is five. So the cosine of this angle right here is four fifths, right? And so, so you could just write four over five. What if people do, and it's fine, this is what I said before, if, if you have a way that you like to do it and you want to do it that way, do it, okay? Like if that's what you're comfortable with, but this is a trick. I'm teaching you a little trick to do it this way. What a lot of people do is they go through and they solve for what this angle would need to be giving, given a three, four, five triangle, right? And then that gives you that angle. And then later on down below, when you say, oh, it's going to be V naught cosine theta, then you calculate cosine of the angle that you just found from the ratio of four to five, right? So it, it is fine. If that's what you have to do, do it, right? Like this, you know, I'll just judge you slightly when I'm, when I'm getting this. No, but I won't. I won't. I mean, you do, you do you. But right now, let me just tell you, it's easier to do the three, four, five thing. Yes, ma'am. That's what I said. <laughs> that's what, that's, I wasn't done yet. I wasn't done yet. <laughs> well, doesn't that, doesn't that just suck, right? There's, let's, let me change this up. Did I say that angle? I meant this, I meant this angle, right? But, but you're, 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 you're absolutely right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is, it is, cosine is, so Katoa, right? Yeah. What is, what's the other one? Some old hippie. What is it? So, caught another hippie tripping on acid. That is right. That's right. <laughs> I think so Katoa is a little bit easier, but uh, but you could. Some old hippie caught another hippie tripping on acid. That's easily what you got. Yeah. So so my apologies for that, but that is. That is, I want, I mean, in this case, it's pretty obvious. I want the horizontal component of it. And so that's where it's the, the four, the four fifths. Yep. But you're right. You're absolutely right. I wasn't done yet, though. I mean, just in my defense. Like, I was just, I was just coming back to that. Okay. So that's it. So, that, so try to do that. If you can see that and you can see the three, four, five, it does make your life a little bit easier. Instead of going to the angle and then taking the angle and then coming back, then, then, then you go from there. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Now let's do the last one. Is the y direction? And we're almost there. Thank you for letting me down gently. You know, he didn't be like. 
Listen to you, dumbass. You're just making fun of people. You're just making fun of people and judging them, right? And it's like, oh, yeah, you're, <laughs> Ooh, yeah, you're right. You really could have let me have it, but you didn't. You were nice. You were gentle. Okay. Same deal. We can just jump right to this equation for SBY. SBY as a function of time is SBY naught plus VBY naught times T plus one half ABY T squared. Okay, so let me just th let's talk about these variables here. Right, this thing starting out. Where's this? What's SBY naught? It was given to us in the problem statement. Right? This is English, so it's 100. So it's starting at 100 feet above the ground. So SBY naught, this is going to be 100. Right? VBY naught is going to be V naught times 3 fifths negative, because right? it's going down. And A, B, Y is negative G. They have 32.2, right? Because we're, do, we're doing stuff in, in, in feet per second squared. We're doing stuff in English units, right? So let me write the simplified equation in its final form. This is equal to 100 minus 3 fifths V naught T minus one half 32.2 t squared that is my last equation okay so once you get done with that at this point right we're, we're basically done so sbyt i'm going to set this guy equal to each these guys e equal to each other right and then i'm going to set these guys equal to each other. I said the x is equal to each other and the y is equal to each other, right? How do you want to solve that? Well, you can do substitution. Right? I could solve for v naught, and I take that v naught and I put it up the, up above there, right? And then substitute it in, and then go from there. What? How do you think I would solve that? The GI eighty nine, bro, right? No cap. No cap, I would use my, I would use my, my, my TI-89, right? And that's exactly what I did. I just literally, TI-89, could, you could solve two equations and two unknowns, right? And you just under the solve, like, again, Google how to do this thing, you just solve, and again, there, you're like, all right, I'm gonna set S to 10T plus 2T squared equal to 4 fifths V naught times T. Go over to the next equation, I'm gonna set 100 minus 3 fifths V naught T minus 1 half 32.2T squared equal to zero. Solve for B naught and T, and then it'll go calculating, and then bam, out pops the answer, right? And the correct answer. And what you get T from doing that, T is equal to 2.22 seconds. Okay. Didn't ask for that. The problem statement didn't ask for that, but you, it was just you had to get it on the way. feet per second, 15.28 feet per second. Again, learn, learn your calculator, learn how to do that, right? There's, you'll see as you move forward in your, you know, not just this class, every class, every engineering class that you take, you're gonna run into like two equations and two unknowns, three equations, three unknowns, all sorts of stuff. It'll pop out of there, right? And you can do it the old-fashioned way where you where you do substitution and all that other stuff, but it'll take up a page worth of it, or you just go. And I really wish my calculator made that noise, and then you hit. And then it's calculating, calculating, and then I'll pop that answer. And in fact, you can't even do this one with, ma you know, it may be learned in math, how do you do it with matrices to solve it? You can't even do that with this one because it's a quadratic, you got a T squared, so, the, so your matrix methods don't even work. You just you do it the long way. Okay, that's it. So then on uh, No Class Monday,
sick. See, college is sick, right? Like, like the no class Monday. We'll see you guys all on Wednesday. Uh, I'll sign another homework today. They'll be due next Friday, and uh, we'll go from there. Cool. Have a good weekend. No, you're gonna have. Yep, you get a one sheet, one one page uh, uh, equation. Yeah. Can make it ourselves. Make yourself. Yeah. I emailed you Brian Cox went to NASA and dropped a bowling ball and a feather together. Oh, you did. Yeah, I emailed you. Yeah. I